wicked problems. What are they, anyway? The best way to understand what a wicked problem is, is to situate it in the problem-solving typology used by cognitive psychologists, to look at some examples of each type of problem, and to see where wicked problems belong on the continuum of problem-solving types. We'll also relate wicked problems to expert-novice differences in problem-solving so we can understand what the underlying skills are for this type of problem-solving. We generally talk about three types of problem, structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. While it is difficult to fix problems into strict categories, we can place them loosely along a continuum in problem-solving terms, from less difficult or complex to more difficult or complex. Let's take each of these one by one. Structured problems are problems that are limited in scope or domain. We sometimes say they are closed. They are easily defined or present pre-stated. You can think of them as being handed to you for solution, much like a lot of problems you do in school. The goal state is known. All information needed is either available or obtainable. And they have a prescribed and rule-based approach for their solution. We say that there is an algorithm or legal move generator for solution. Generally, there is a single solution or right answer. So this is a structured problem. Most math and some basic science problems are categorized as structured problems. Entire fields that are based on rules or laws in the universal sense, like laws of physics or geometry, are structured domains. Semi-structured problems have some features of structured problems. For example, the goal state is known, but they begin to move in the direction of what is called a semantically rich problem domain. So we are moving from this less difficult uh, area toward this more difficult or more complex type of a problem. Most applied sciences are structured or semi-structured domains. Engineering problems, for example, or medical diagnosis. There is a clear goal. They rely on large bodies of prior knowledge and proven practice, including standards for solution processes. And most or all of the information for solution is available or can be obtained, even if with some difficulty. However, semi-structured problems rely on professional judgment, and it may be possible to choose among or adapt known operators for, for solution. In this sense, they are no longer structured, although the range of possible solutions may be limited or may represent variations on a theme. Unstructured problems, in contrast, do not share any of the characteristics of structured and semi-structured problems. Unstructured problems lack a clear goal state, and information needed to solve them is often not available or obtainable. Unstructured problems are complex, but they are also what is often called messy because of their other common characteristics. They are multilogical or interdisciplinary in nature, with needed information not obvious in terms of disciplinary bounds, and they tend to be deeply involved with values. There is no algorithm or move generators for solution. There may be more than one possible answer or stages of answer, meaning that the solution is not always a clear choice and may not be a permanent one. It may instead be an interim solution or step. There may not even be clear or definite criteria for goal evaluation. We may not know in advance the best way to evaluate whether we're achieving our, what our solution is designed to achieve. In this way, the solutions to unstructured problems may be novel, as may the problems themselves. And that is why they are at this extreme end of difficulty or complexity. Unstructured problem solving has been called social science problem solving because they tend to be tied to society, social systems, and human behavior, including decision making. They are big and usually persistent and dynamic. So, poverty, has been around forever, health care, education, and most problems of general management in business, including new venture creation, are considered to be unstructured problems. 
which leads us to the connection between unstructured and wicked problems. They are closely related. The term wicked problem has become a popular way of referring to unstructured problems in recent decades. The word wicked connotes the messy and brain frying aspects of such problems, that they are persistent, intransigent, elusive, or seemingly impossible to solve, complex in every sense. Their solutions mean change with all its uncertainty and difficult trade-offs, but also the potential for great reward. Here are some of the wicked problems that plague business according to a 2008 survey by Neutron and Stanford University. You can see how many of them connect to questions of innovation. Difficult uh, things like prediction, innovating, change, combination or synthesis, we'll talk about this more, collaboration as we've talked about before, change again. Solving wicked problems is not for amateurs. Researchers like to talk about expert-novice differences in problem solving. There are things that experts in their domains do that enable them to solve complex problems. In our own venture into wicked problem solving in this class, we're going to engage in some of the things that differentiate experts from novices. Fortunately for us, many of these skills and habits of mind are what are called domain general. They do not rely on specific technical information about a field. They are more than anything else about learned, and I would say unlearned, behavior. Studies of differences in experts and novices suggest that experts and novices vary along several dimensions. Here is a highly abbreviated synthesis of some of the findings related to wicked problem solving, and in general, the skills that allow people to approach and solve unstructured problems. One of the most important is the ability to see patterns, first identified by de Groot in studying chess experts. This allows them to think many moves ahead and to anticipate what others may do, thereby allowing one to defend or change strategy. As Wayne Gretzky said, you skate to where the puck will be, not to where it is. This skill is crucial for innovators and entrepreneurs. So here's just a short video clip which represents the sort of visualization skills that often come with paddock pattern recognition. Uh, that's Susan Polger, a chess expert, who is so skilled at anticipating and visualizing the board that she can actually play by phone. Another difference is planning. Experts spend a lot of time up front, organizing and dealing with open constraints and breaking the problem down into its related parts whereas novices tend to jump to and overfocus on the solution, or in innovation terms, the idea. So you will hear me say over and over again, if you start with your idea, you will get into trouble. And your first idea is not your best idea. Experts are highly revisionist and formalize many of their planning activities, as we will in class. So I hope you recognize some of these. We have Edgar Degas up here. Always, uh, you know, you can see sometimes hundreds of sketches or models for a final thing. Leonardo da Vinci, similarly, for the Sistine Chapel and for other work. He was <clears throat> well known for doing such things as uh, uh, working on cadavers uh, to study their uh, muscle and bone structure. And this is a little piece of one of many revisions of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. This is highlighted because um, nobody's quite sure which of the many revisions this, this was. In process terms, uh, the idea of planning uh, means that unstructured problem is highly iterative and flexible rather than a linear or purely linear and rigid process. 
and depends on full understanding of its complexity so that all the pieces may be connected and synthesized. Um, while experts are known for the detailed approach to execution uh, at this stage, uh, experts are very well known for being uh, big planners um, at all stages. They tend to spend most of their time in these less structured areas identifying the problem in the first instance, pathfinding, that's what I call it anyway, um, an approach to trying to solve the problem, and evaluating their many, many, many ideas. Uh, whereas novices tend to spend less time on these stages and much more of their time rather just jumping uh, to the idea and sometimes right to just executing the idea with not a lot of planning uh, in between. Um, so you can see here uh, this is what I mean about it being an iterative process. Experts tend to go back and forth throughout the process. Um, and here they may be going back and forth really quite a bit. So one of the challenges with wicked problem solving is to not um, try to turn a wicked problem into a structured problem because it is not. We do want to break uh, our problems down, but we ultimately must resynthesize them. Uh, so while problems should be broken down to understand them in their entirety, compartmentalized solutions do little to change wicked problem dynamics. Another characteristic of expert problem solvers is really quite simply repetition or practice. It takes a long time to acquire skill and that can be frustrating. It takes commitment, motivation, persistence, and lots of trial and error and failure. But with practice comes automaticity, which can manifest itself as intuition, wisdom, insight, even genius or a gift, certainly talent. But mostly, expertise is the result of hard work over time. So a lot of us are familiar with the idea of practice when it comes to things like sports. Um, but we think of practice as also applying to very, very intangible things like problem solving uh, and actually like management, particularly general management and management of innovation. That in itself takes practice. So here is uh, the result of practice plus bringing it all together, orchestral work. Uh, that is my nephew, Greg Robbins, in the clip, uh, conducting uh, Beethoven. I believe this is Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 2. Um, my nephew is the uh, founder as well as the conductor of Delphi Orchestra, which is playing here. As we will see later in class, many of these characteristics are related to creativity and what we know about creative people and tie into our understanding of different types of thinking, including systems thinking, critical thinking, and creative thinking. With practice and the permission to be so, we can all learn to be more creative and be the ones who can tackle wicked problems. Okay, last time. This is your brain. This is wicked problems. This is your brain on wicked problems. Any questions?